I want to thank all of you for coming on a, on a Saturday. I, I know there are some important football games going on today, and you're missing maybe some of that, and you have other things going on, but uh, we're really glad you're here. And I appreciate hearing from President DeSteiger. Uh, Oklahoma Christian is a special, special place. And it's been a special place for a long time. It was a special place, Terry, when you were there. I remember standing in the audience when you announced the coming of an engineering school, which I was so thrilled about. But I think that John said something that's right. Well, he said a lot of things are right, but something that's really right. I, I think that Christian education may be more important today than ever before in our history. We live in an unusual world today. We live in a changing world. And we need Oklahoma Christian, and we're thankful for it. And my job this morning is to give you a picture of leadership. I, uh, I know there are a lot of places to go for a picture of leadership in the scriptures. I use the scriptures from the front to the back to teach leadership rather frequently, but I have chosen to use a passage out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul is talking about his own leadership when he was in that church. Now, the reason why Paul has to talk about his own leadership is because he is often criticized. Now, I want you to let that soak in. He's often challenged. Hey, you ever thought about the kind of personality Paul had? If you read the book of Acts, especially, you, you get this strong idea that Paul has this personality where he is direct, he is focused, he is determined. He's kind of this no-nonsense type person. You get the picture, at least. He's not the kind of person who's always out there telling jokes. Maybe Barnabas is. Paul's probably not. And yet this picture of leadership will show him to be a bit different. And yet, it's probably because of that directness, probably because of that focus, that when he leaves a place, sometimes people will look at him and they'll begin to discredit him and criticize. That, my friends, is the nature of leadership. I learned that a few years back. At the place where I worked every year, certain faculty members would apply for rank advancement and or tenure. Now, to apply for that, you had to have this huge portfolio, and it would contain your teaching evaluations, and it would contain uh, committee assignments, and it would take, contain things that you had done in your particular discipline to enhance your learning and your ability and and then those would be reviewed by a committee of faculty, a, a peer committee. And they would review and make their recommendations, bring the recommendations to me, and I would in turn give them to the board of trustees. One year, a man asked me if I would write for him a letter of recommendation. I thought nothing about it. I, I, I'd worked with him on several projects. I wrote him a little letter, letter of recommendation, put it in that portfolio. I guess he put it in the portfolio. Sometime later, all of these volumes of material were brought to my office. I never reviewed them. I, I skimmed the letters. And as I was skimming the letter for this one man for whom I had written the letter of recommendation, his, his idea of becoming an associate professor was they didn't let him do it. And I read that, and, but that was a minor part of the letter. I began to read the letter more. And, wow. It began to talk more about me than, than this man. And it said, how dare the president to write a letter of recommendation for anyone? And if he were going to do this, he's already made up his mind. He's going to give the guy this rank advancement. And, and, and what are we? It, just, it, it was a brutal letter. So I picked up the phone and I called the chair of that committee, who is a PhD clinical psychologist. And he's really at the top of his field. In fact, he also works for the city of Lubbock Police Department, where he is the specialist in crisis intervention, hostage negotiation, and all that. He's at the top of his field everywhere. I said, Andy, would you have time to come to my office and visit for a moment? He said, I'll be right there. Andy walked in with all smiles. And I said, Andy, I'm reading this letter, and 
You know, Andy, it sounds like you guys got behind closed doors and you took the opportunity just to beat me to death. And, and you made all kinds of assumptions. Did you ever think about calling me and asking me to come over and tell you why I wrote a letter of recommendation? I would write a letter of recommendation for anyone who asked me. He said, no. And I said, well, is it true you just took this opportunity to, to beat me to death and to criticize? He said, yes. I said, well, Andy, we're really trying hard to be a Christian university. Uh, what's Christian about that? He said, nothing. Nothing's Christian about that. He said, but may I tell you something? May I tell you something from the world of psychology? People in general detest bureaucracy. And the one who is head of what they think is bureaucracy, if anything goes wrong, if anything is uncomfortable to them, they will take the opportunity to beat you up like this and to criticize you over and over and over again. And he said, it's the way of life for someone in your position. And I thought, wow. I think he's right. I think all leaders are targets of a lot of criticism. I remember Susan and I were sitting in a back room backstage with President George W. Bush right after he got out of office, waiting for him to give a speech. And I remember him looking at us saying, I am so glad. He said, I have never found anything so brutal in my entire life. You're going to get criticized. You're going to get criticized. But I beg you, I beg you, do not let criticism paralyze you or stop you from doing what's right in the kingdom of heaven. Paul was criticized over and over and over again. It did not stop him. And so he defends and he says, don't you remember what I was really like when I was there? Now, I'm going to move through this material very, very quickly. It's, it's not new material to you. I know that. But I'd like to have time to land on the last point and emphasize the last point because I consider it to be one of the most powerful points for leadership I know. So Paul begins in verse 3 and he says it like this, if I can read it. For the appeal we make does not spring from error, impure motive, not trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. We, we, you know we never use flattery, nor do we use a mask to cover up our greed. We're not looking for the praise of men or from anyone else. Two quick things I want to tell you about that passage. One is truth. The other is humility. Both a part of the picture of leadership. Now, I want you to hear what I have to say today. I want you to hear what this passage has to say, not what I have to say today. You know what I really wish? I wish people who occupied the offices in our nation's capital could hear what we're saying this morning. Amen. Because truth is absolutely necessary in leadership. It's absolutely foundational in leadership. In fact, you have some notes. I'm not using the PowerPoint. I didn't want to use the PowerPoint. But I gave you some notes. And you may find a formula. Truth plus grace practiced over time will lead to a healthy organization. Truth can't be heard without grace. Truth can't be heard without kindness. But truth is essential. You cannot make good decisions for tomorrow without knowing the truth of today. Truth equals reality. Truth is your very best friend. And yet, I watch people over and over again in this country, and they spin the truth for their political gain, or they flat out tell lies, and that filters down into all kinds of organizations in this country. And I'm not saying it filters down into the Lord's kingdom. But I will tell you, sometimes we even are afraid 
to tell the whole story. We're afraid to tell the whole story. Now, I've made it this policy in my life. I followed it fairly well. I will I, I, did you hear what John said? And you hear what the introduction said about him? If you have questions, ask him. He'll tell you. Here's the policy. I'll tell you everything I know. Everything I know. I'll be as transparent as I know how to be. Unless it's personal or private in the life of some person or unless it's illegal. Bar that. You're going to hear exactly what's going on, why I made the decision, whatever it is. But here's the deal. Too many of us are afraid that our people can't handle the truth. And so we do this old thing of sweeping the dirt under the rug and hope that no one will notice the lump. And the problem is everybody knows it's a lump because your people are really, really smart. Your people see through it. You can't lead without truth. And you can't lead without humility. Any one of these topics you could spend the entire session on. You understand that, don't you? At least you spend 30 minutes or 40 minutes on humility. But do you realize that God will not bless anything other than humility? I, I, I used to be asked by a committee, who do you want for a trustee member? My standard response was always this. I don't care. So long as they have two qualities. They got to be people who are humble and people who are full of faith because that's what God blesses. And I said, we're in an institution by all worldly standards that should not exist. And the only reason we exist and the only reason we flourish is because of the grace of God. And if we want God's help, it starts with humility and it starts with faith. Got to have both. Jim Collins wrote a book years ago, and it's, it's an old leadership classic. People don't read it much anymore, but it was called Good to Great. I like the book because Jim Collins said, you know, out of all my research, his team of researchers did it for him, I'm sure, but I found those companies in America that were really, really good. 400 and something companies are really good. And, and I decided, based on some criteria, how many of those companies have made it to the great status, from good to great. He found 11. His number one out of five principle was this. Every one of those companies that became great was led by someone with unusual humility. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. Picture leadership truth, humility. And then, then if you keep reading verse 7, he's going to say, and do you remember when we were like, with you, we were like a, uh, we, we were gentle like a, like a mother caring for a little child. Does that surprise you? Now think about it. Does that surprise you? That gentleness is in the picture of leadership? I, I thought leadership was demanding. I thought leadership was get this thing done. I thought leadership was correctness. And Paul says, no, when we were with you, we were gentle. And may I tell you that leaders need to be gentle. And leaders in the kingdom especially need to be gentle because lives are so very, very messed up. And the best of our lives have all kinds of struggles and problems and difficulties. And one of the most special things you can ever do is help people retain their own personal dignity. I've had the unfortunate experience of having to remove several people from employment. I tried my best throughout all those times to do it in a way that those people would retain their dignity. And I even went farther than that. I tried to do it in a way that they remained my friend. And I've not always been successful in that latter part. But I'll tell you, in the last 10 days, I messaged a person. I don't have any social network except LinkedIn. And I messaged a person 
whom I released, who was so very talented, who was so very good, but he had a situation where I had no choice. He's at another university. He has a massive position at another university. I messaged him like I do frequently, and I said, you are doing such a powerful job, and you're changing lives, and you're influencing people. And we had a nice little conversation. Because people don't need to be beaten up again. And people don't need to be roughed up again, no matter what they've done. Great leaders understand this principle of gentleness. Now, if you go down another verse or so, there's a statement in there about hard work. He said, you remember when we were with you how we labored night and day not to be a burden to any of you? I won't say much about that, except I'm going to tell you something. There is this feeling about leadership that says the higher you go in leadership, the easier it is and the more perks, perks that you have. Well, it's true. The higher you go in leadership, there are some definite benefits but what I have found is the work gets harder and harder and harder. And the hours get longer. And how many hours does an eldership spend talking about this issue and that issue? And how many do they spend in prayer for their people? And how many hours do you spend going out and taking care of people? And how many hours do you spend with someone who comes in and says, our family has a problem. Will you pray for us? Will you help us? How much work is involved in that? in order not to be a burden to any of you. I tell you, if you want to know leadership, go study the book where Nehemiah is presented. Go look at that book. He had all types of opportunities as a governor to take all these perks. He said, I'll not do it. Paul didn't do it either. He'd rather make tents than be a burden to people. I remember one time some trustees came along and said, we're going to put you a parking place right here. We're going to put your name right here. And I said, please, Please don't hurt me like that. I said, if you'll watch, I park in the farthest spot on the parking lot. Rain, snow, wind, I don't care. I park in the farthest spot and I walk the farthest. Because I think that's how leaders work. And now he says this. He says, you are our witnesses, and so is God, of how holy and righteous and blameless we were when we were with you. You are our witnesses of how holy and righteous and blameless we were when we were with you. Picture of leadership is truth, it's humility, it's gentleness, it's hard work, it's not taking advantage of things. But this picture of leadership is also one of example. Here's the raw truth about being a leader. Somebody is always watching. Did you know that? Somebody is always watching. I, I, I was in a city for most of my career that was rather small compared to some cities like Tulsa and Oklahoma City, but just 250,000 people. But I quickly learned, I quickly learned that everywhere I would go, there may be a student out there whom I didn't recognize, but they certainly saw me. And maybe they were current students or maybe they were former students. And then before long, I was gotten to where I had spoken all over that community and, 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 and people would see me. I, not, I might not know them, but they knew me and they were watching. And then I found out I could go places like Dallas and Fort Worth. And I can walk into a motel one time. And the guy's checking me in, and he said, you look familiar to me. And I said, um, he said, I think I saw your picture in a magazine. It wasn't one of those jailbird magazines that, you know, but <laughs> he said, I think it was an LCU magazine. And I said, yeah, that probably was me. Now, what if I had been upset about my key not working? Or what if I had been doing something else? Because somebody's always watching. I, I was going to North Dallas one time to give some talks. 
I was running late. I hadn't stopped to eat, had not stopped to eat. I needed to eat before I got to this location. I, you know how you are when you're driving 70 miles an hour? And you think, and they, I, I must, well, no, it's too late. I missed that one. So I made up my mind, the next place I see, the next sign I see, no matter what, I'm stopping. The sign was Hooters. <laughs> now, I didn't stop. <laughs> because I figured I'd walk in, there'd be one of my students there, okay? <laughs> Somebody's always watching. And all it takes, all it takes is one thing for them to begin to be able to repeat it over and over again and try to destroy your credibility. I don't know what kind of time I got left. I got my favorite one left right here. Look, at, look right down the line here. He said, and when we were with you, we were like a father, encouraging and exhorting you to live lives worthy of the calling. This may be the greatest thing I know about it, leadership. It may be the best part of the picture about leadership. Leaders are givers of hope. Leaders are givers of hope in a world that seems to quickly lose hope. And leaders are encouragers. That's how you give hope. Now here's the rule. Every single person needs a lot of encouragement. Every single one of us. I don't know if Terry wants me to mention it or not. But Terry said, how's your family, Ken? It's good. How's your family, Terry? Good. Well, not so good. I got to get home as fast as I can because we just had a diagnosis of one of our daughters that does not look favorable. And my wife's going kind of crazy on it. Is that all right me to say that? I need to pray for that family right now. Does he need encouragement? Does my wife need encouragement once every six weeks? No. It's all the time. And we have these two grown children. They're in their 40s. I know I don't look that old. It's just my genetics, okay? But they're both in their 40s. And what I'm finding is they may need more encouragement right now than they've ever needed in their lives. I, I can say to our daughter, your, your hair is different. It looks really good. And it's like, it's like I've given her a million dollars. I wish I could give her a million dollars. But I can say, like I said not very long ago, Jeannie, I think you're prettier right now than you've ever been in your life. And wow, what a difference it makes. These four grandchildren, and yes, the oldest is an Oklahoma Christian. I stopped by yesterday, had just a little bitty, tiny bit of time to take her to a quick, quick lunch before she went to this physics class. And I told her physics is really hard. She said, I know, you know, so. But when I left, I said, Mackenzie, I texted her. I have it right here or I put my phone back in my car. But I tell you, said, you may be the prettiest and happiest at this point in your life I've ever seen. She responded and said, it's by far my best semester ever at OC. Does she need encouragement? Do the two 14-year-olds need encouragement? Does a 16-year-old need encouragement? All the time. All the time. Let, 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 me, let me tell you about life. I describe the teen years, the teen years, as the decade of self. That's not necessarily selfishness. That's self. Because they're, they're focused on themselves. They're focused on their body. Hey, am I developing like she is? And, and, and am I going to be as tall as he is? And will I be able to play sports like they do? And it, it's, it's such a self-orientation, and it is a miserably hard time. And they've got to have a lot of encouragement. The decade of the 20s, I call the struggle years. Now, you think it's fun and games. You think you're going off to college and it's all going to be partying. And I'm telling you, I didn't see that. There's some good moments. 
But I have found that those 20s, they're trying to figure out which pathway do I take in life and what career do I choose and, and how do I get through this time management problem of all these courses and, and will I find a mate here? And, and, and they struggle. Do you think they need encouragement? In the 30s, they're striving. They're in that new career and they're trying to get to the top of that career and they're looking down the street and they're looking at the house their neighbors live in and say, do I compare? And they're looking at the car and say, do I compare? And am I getting going to get promoted like I should? And, and it's just strive, strive, strive. And all the while they've got three little kids at home and they're trying to balance all that. And do they need encouragement? 40s may be the worst. 40s may be the worst. People start searching. The better word is questioning. I wonder if I even chose the right career pathway. <clears throat> Sadly, this is a question. I wonder if I chose the right mate. Our kids are older now and they're about to go off to college and I wonder if I did it right. And they question and question and question. Do you think they need encouragement? You get to the 50s and that's where you hit your stride and you're going strong. And if you answered all those questions, you're 40 pretty well, then you're, you're, you're about the most productive you're ever going to be in your lifetime. But because you're running so fast and you're so productive, there are all kinds of burdens and all kinds of difficulties. Do you think you need encouragement? 60s, everything changes. I've never, never, ever dealt with people in the 60s that this hasn't changed except for maybe once or twice. When you get about 60 years old, time is reversed. You look at time in reverse. Up until that, you're looking to the future, building for the future. When you get about 60, you start asking questions like this. How much time do I have left and what do I want to do with it? And so you're looking for significance. And you try to stretch that significance on past the 60s into the 70s, but the 70s get slippery. And health begins to fade so easily. And some of us are blessed to get into the 80s. But it's still slippery. Do those people need encouragement? May I just, I knew this really well. My granddaughter told me yesterday, sitting at Brahms, I love John DeSteiger. He is so friendly and encouraging. Those are her words. Yesterday. Now, in an eldership, do you think you need to be busy with encouragement? I mean, it's the little lady who's been coming for two or three years now by herself because her husband's gone. All it takes is to smile, and I don't smile enough, but it takes a smile to say, you know how much you mean to us here? It's so special. Or, you sure look pretty today. Or you grab this young person and say, you have so much potential. And that's what young people love to hear that over and over again. Hey, the future is great for you. You have so much potential. It, it just takes little things. That prayer you led this morning, you made one statement in that prayer. That was so powerful. Thank you for that prayer. You see how encouragement works? Every single person needs it. And I'll just tell you something. You won't ever be any, very, any better leader than you are encourager. And some of you are more gifted at it than others, but everybody has responsibility to it. But you will never be any better leader than you are encourager. This young man right back here, I heard him lead singing at Westside at Norman a couple of Wednesday nights ago. I'm doing a... 12-week series, if it gets to last that long, they're thinking about running me off, I think. But on leadership, Susan and I were together that night. He got up and led singing. She looked over at me and said, man, that young man can lead singing really, really well. So I saw him this morning. What's the first thing I said to you? You're a good song leader. You're a good song leader. Here's what I saw. Why did I do that? Did I have anything to gain? Paul said, I'm not given to flattery, and I'm going to tell you something. Flattery is another lie. Flattery is a lie. Flattery is a compliment you give to somebody for, their, for your good. I, I come up and say to you, oh, you're such a great guy, and I'm hoping I get something from it. Compliments are what you say good about people for their good, not for your own. 
There was nothing to gain. So, just a picture of leadership. Simple picture of leadership from the Apostle Paul. Leaders are truth people. Leaders are humble people. Leaders are gentle people, contrary to what the world thinks. Leaders are hard workers that don't take advantage of a bunch of perks because they love the people too much. And leaders are people who constantly are aware that people are watching and they try their best to be a good example, although none of us is perfect. And leaders are these wonderful, great encouragers. And they never stop. They never stop because everybody needs it and everybody responds to it and everybody appreciates it.